let's get into the rest of, more of chapter four and classifying chemical reactions a little bit differently. Uh, they can be classified as we did in regular chemistry, synthesis, double displacement, single displacement, decomposition, and combustion reactions. But those can also be classified into precipitation reactions, which were one type of double displacement we did, uh, acid base reactions, and oxidation reduction reactions. Right now I just want to talk about precipitation reactions and how those work. So a precipitation reaction is a reaction in which one of the double displacement, in which a solid forms, and then the rest of the stuff is solution. What happens is two of the ions, a positive and negative ion, do not dissolve in water, so they form a precipitate that sits at the bottom of the solution. The rest of the solution contains the ions that do dissolve in water. The precipitate is a solid that's going to form and sit at the bottom. Here's an example of a precipitation reaction in which potassium chromate gets together with barium nitrate, and they're both aqueous solutions, which means that all of these ions dissolve in water. And then when they're added together, we have some ions that do not dissolve. So the barium and the chromate ions, when they find each other, they do not dissolve in water. They stick together and they form the solid, which we see at the bottom of the beaker here. The spectator ions would be the potassium and the nitrate ions. Those are called spectators because they do not react at all, and they'd be found right up here in the um, beaker here. So we have potassium ions, we have nitrate ions here, and then down here is where we're getting the barium chromate solid. Here's another example of a precipitation reaction. React with chloride ions to form the precipitate silver chloride. In this animation of a precipitation reaction, the silver ions shown in gray and the chloride ions shown in green are active participants in the reaction and combine to form the insoluble silver chloride crystal. Other ions, called spectator ions, shown here in blue and purple, are not participants in the reaction and remain unchanged in the solution. So there you go. All right, so precipitate and uh, is insoluble. So something that's soluble is a solid that dissolves in the solution. Insoluble would be a precipitate that does not dissolve. A lot of times insoluble and slightly soluble are used interchangeably. All right, here are the rules. The simple rules, as it says. Nitrates are soluble. Alkali metals are soluble. Um, and NH4 plus are soluble. So alkali metals being like potassium, sodium, lithium, those are the most common ones here. Most halogens are soluble, except for some. Most sulfates are soluble, except for some. Hydroxides can be soluble, um, but only some of them. And then we have sulfides, carbonates, chromates, and all these, need, you need to know all these. So, what we have is a memory device for you, and it's called MagSeg, and it's something you'll need to know the whole semester, and we'll use it in a lot of different ways or for a lot of different topics. So NAGSEG, these are the things that are soluble. So you need to know what NAGSEG stands for. First of all, nitrates. All nitrates are soluble, no matter what. Acetates. All acetates are soluble, no matter what. So it could be lead acetate. It could be potassium acetate. It doesn't matter. Um, group 1 is going to be soluble. So anything that is a sodium or lithium or potassium compound, soluble. Sulfates are going to be soluble, except for PMS and castrobare. So if it's sodium sulfate, sure. If it's calcium sulfate, no, not soluble. Strontium sulfate, not soluble. PMS would be lead, mercury, and silver. I know it doesn't work as far as how it works. It's just a memory device. So lead is for the P, M is for the mercury, S is for the silver. Ammonium are always soluble. And then group 17 halogens. So um, if I have some sort of chloride, all chlorides or iodides or bromides are soluble unless it is lead, mercury, or silver of those. If you know these rules, you'll be very helpful for everything that you do. Well, not everything, but a lot of things you do in this class. So let's ask a question about that. Which of the following ions would form compounds that are generally 
soluble in water with lead. Well, remember that neg seg are just the things that are, are soluble. It doesn't say anything about sulfides being soluble, so that's a no-go. It says chlorides are soluble, except for lead or PMS, so that's not soluble. It says all nitrates are soluble, so that might be our ticket. Sulfates, except for PMS again, so no lead sulfate is not soluble. And lead is not going to form a compound with another positive ion. No-go. So there is our answer. The nitrate ion would be the one that it could form a soluble compound with. All right. Let's just do a little review here of what types of equations we have. We have formula equations, which just show the reaction that is happening. Remember, we're going to put aqueous in the solutions and then solid um, and aqueous for the other ions that are not um, a precipitate. So that's just an example. An ionic equation will take that same thing and it will break it apart into all the ions. So everything that's aqueous will break apart into its positive and negative ions. The solid will stay together as a solid. Now, the important thing in AP Chem is all, anytime it's an ionic um, reaction or precipitation reaction, AP Chem wants net ionic equations. So from the previous equation, we're taking out the nitrate ions and the silver ions because they're spectators. They're there before and after in aqueous form, so we're getting rid of them. This is the net equation, what actually is actually reacting to form a new thing, a new solid. So that is called a net ionic equation. All right, a little concept check for you. Correct formula equation, ionic equation, and net ionic for cobalt 2 chloride and sodium hydroxide. This would be a good thing to try right now. Go ahead and press pause and give it a whirl. All right, here are the answers for those. There is the answer for the formula equation. In this case, it's balanced. The complete ionic equation. And here is the answer for the net ionic equation, where it is just this cobalt getting together with two hydroxide ions to make CO. OH2, which is the solid form in this case. All right, so we have some stoichiometry to work with here, like it or not. Here are some steps you can follow. Identify the species present, write the balance net ionic, and we'll calculate the moles, determine which reactant's limiting, calculate the moles, convert the grams as required. Well, let's do a problem like this and actually see what it's like. So which precipitate will form? Well, to figure out which precipitate will form, we'll kind of have to look at our rules. So we have sodium phosphate, whoops, sodium phosphate mixed with lead nitrate. So our chance, our, our uh, choices for precipitates will be sodium nitrate, because the sodium will now get together with the nitrate, or lead to phosphate, lead to phosphate look like this. Well, as we know from NAGSEG, all group 1 things are always soluble and nitrates are always soluble. So that leaves that out as our precipitate. So our precipitate is going to be PV3PO4-2. This happens to have a molar mass of 811.54 grams per mole. The reason I put that down is because the next question is going to be what mass of that will form. Well, to determine that, we're going to have to figure out what, which one of these two things is going to limit our reaction here. So we, we, we're going to have to come up with the uh, net ionic equation. Now, we'll kind of work backwards in this case, just to be um, a little lazy. But we have three PV ions, right, getting together with the 2 plus plus two PO4 ions, that's a three minus, and we're making PB3PO4 two, okay? So we try to figure out which one's going to limit us as far as getting this reaction. Here I have 10 times th 0.3, remember I can take milliliters times molarity to get moles, I'm going to go ahead and change this to liters. Um, well, I'll just do the moles, first of all. So if I take 0.3 times 10, that'll give me 3 millimoles 
which is equal to 0 0.003 moles of this solution. And here I have 20 times 0.2, which gives me 4 millimoles, which is equal to 0 0.004 moles of solution. All right. So I can real quick figure out which one is going to give me the least amount of product. So how do I do that? Well, I have 0 0.003 moles of phosphate ions because it's Na3PO4. I only get one phosphate for every Na3PO4, so that's my moles of my phosphate ions. And I can put moles of ions down here. And for every two moles of ions, I'm, I uh, make one mole of PB3PO4. So 0 0.003 divided by 2 looks like 0 0.0015 um, moles of PB3PO4. What about the other stuff? I have 0 0.004 moles of this lead to nitrate. Lead to nitrate is PbNO3-2. Again, I only get one Pb for every one unit here, so it's going to be the same on a moles of Pb ions. So moles of Pb, 2 plus, looks like there's 3 moles for every 1 mole of PB3PO4 2. Getting a little messy. So I take 0 0.004 divided by 3 and I get 0 0.0013. So it looks like this guy, my lead ions, are what is limiting me. This is my limiting reactant. So how do I get to my answer? How, what the mass is of the precipitate? Well, this is what, 0 0.0013, this is repeating, moles of PB3PO42. Remember I told you the uh, molar mass was this guy. So I would go 811.54 grams for every one mole. Multiply those through. And I get 1.1. My sig figs looks like I have two sig figs everywhere. 1.1 grams of the precipitate. So long problem, tough problem, but uh, something you'll need to be able to do. All right, let's try another type of problem, a little bit different. So there's our answers. Mass precipitate, 1.1 grams. All right, two more. They get a little bit, they get a little crazy here. So now, I want to figure out the concentration of the nitrate ions. Remember, the nitrate ions are in solution. They're not the precipitate. They're left over in solution. So how in the world can I figure this out? How in the world can I figure this out? How many nitrate ions do I have? Looks like I have um, 0 0.004 moles of PbNO3. Since I have that, I can do this, 0 0.004 moles of PbNO3-2 for every one mole of PbNO3-2. I have two moles of nitrate ions. So that tells me I have 0 0.008 moles of nitrate ions. Okay. What's the concentration? Well, if I figure out concentration, remember, I have to do molarity. So I have to do moles, 0 0.008 moles of nitrate, divided by my total volume now. My total volume is 10 plus 20, so it's 30.0 milliliters, which is also known as 0 0.0300 liters. So 0 0.008. divided by 0 0.03 is 
gives me an answer of 0.27 molar. That is the molarity of the nitrate ions. So I figured out how many nitrate ions, because that's the only place they're coming from, is from the lead tube nitrate. All of them are staying in solution. It's the only thing that's changing is the volume is increasing. All right, let's try the last type of problem that we're going to do in this video, which is a little bit more difficult, I think, just in case you're thinking that was too easy. This is kind of a doozy. What about the phosphate ions? How much, what's the concentration of the phosphate ions left over after the reaction is complete? Remember, the lead to nitrate, even though we're making, we're going lead 2 plus plus P, PO4 3 minus, we are making PB3 PO4 2. We're making that. I know it's not balanced, so balance it twice if that bothers you. But this is my limiting reactant. So that means that some of this is left over. There is some of those ions left in the solution because there's not enough lead to react with all of it to make all that solid. So how in the world can I figure out how much is left over? Well, just like we've done before, let's figure out how much was used. So I'm going to go ahead and go back to my previous problem and say, hey, I have 0.004 moles of lead ions and for every three moles of lead ions I react with two moles of phosphate ions. So I can figure out from doing that how many moles of phosphate ions would be used when I react all the lead. So I'm going to go 0 0.004 times 2 divided by 3. And I get 0 0.0026 repeating as my number of moles of lead or of phosphate ions that would get used. And then I think about how much phosphate ions did I originally have. So my original phosphate ions were, remember, I have 0 0.003 moles of Na3PO4. That's my stuff. So if I have 0, 0.00 moles of that, I have 0, 0.00 moles of Na3, of the PO4s. Because for every one Na3PO4, I have one PO4 unit. So, I'm going to go ahead and figure that out. Well, so I have 0 0.003 to start with. So if I take the 0 0.003, my starting amount of moles of the um, phosphate ions, minus what I used, which is this, what it reacted with, 0 0.0026 repeating, I get... Zero, 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 three repeating moles of phosphate ions. That's not what they're asking, is it? They're asking the concentration. So to do that, I need to go molarity equals my moles of ions, point zero, 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 three repeating moles of phosphate ions, divided by the volume of the whole solution. Notice how it says assume no volume change. So I have my total volume of solution is 30 milliliters again, which is also known as 0 0.03 liters. So I take that number, and I get 0 0.011, well, we are repeating numbers, but two sig figs here, two here, three here, it looks like my final answer is going to have two sig figs. Um, so I did my sig figs wrong here. So that will be the molarity of my phosphate ions in the end. So tough problem, a lot to think about, um, but I wanted to show you an example before we do some practice in class. There's the answer. Thank you.